Hi, it's uh, Jeff Miskoff, Dr. Miskoff, and it's March 19, 2020, about 7 p.m., and I am uh, reporting again from my living room after my fourth day in the medical ICU, and now uh, three officially confirmed uh, COVID-19s in the ICU, and one very probable that we'll have back uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, it is March 19th, and uh, I have to say that 20 years ago tonight I got married, uh, to my beautiful wife, I think most of uh, most of our friends uh, have met and know Bernadette, and uh, I have to say, uh, you know, I love you, honey, and I hope I have 20 times two more with you. Uh, but I never thought that I'd be broadcasting um, on COVID-19. Uh, we were supposed to have a nice dinner in New York City, but uh, obviously plans have changed for everybody, and uh, we just consider ourselves lucky to be here and, and healthy today. Um, again, after four days in the ICU, um, it's been challenging. Um, so, uh, on that note, uh, there are, you know, many updates. I'm getting inundated with, uh, messages and thank yous, uh, to all the staff, um, at our hospitals and everything that we do in the front lines. Um, special shout out to my respiratory therapist for sending me excess amounts of information. Thank you, Erica, um, and others. And, uh, of course the nurses and other doctors forming chat rooms and, and really keeping the information uh, rolling here. Um, so it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, at any rate, uh, as far as the treatment goes in the ICU, um, pretty much the same thing. We did initiate zinc therapy uh, on uh, our patients uh, in the ICU and I think uh, maybe even outside of the unit. Um, that was 50 milligrams twice a day or BID. I don't know if it's going to have any effect, but uh, it is at least being used prophylactically, and we thought there was little, very little downside. Uh, we are running out of vitamin C IV. Uh, we've been running that at 6 grams or 6,000 milligrams uh, twice a day or BID IV. And um, I, I think that that uh, is having a positive effect, but we're, we're not sure, of course, and we'll have to look back at all of this. Um, and we'll see if there's randomized trials with uh, vitamin C. Uh, I'm sure there's probably already uh, some that have designed them or even started. Uh, with that said, uh, big news today uh, from, uh, from the government. And hydroxychloroquine is, uh, I believe, fast track approved. That's possible. I didn't get a chance to actually watch it. I caught a clip as I was uh, in a patient's room. Um, but uh, it is being used, I think, by pretty much everyone now. And there are primaries that I hear are using it prophylactically with zinc and, and getting good results and adding the azithromycin. The old Z-Pak has come back. And not that we think an antibiotic would have antivi uh, antiviral properties uh, necessarily, but in a way it may be anti-inflammatory, and we've seen that story before with our asthmatics and our COPDers uh, with a reduced length of stay um, uh, and uh, that mucin receptor blockade uh, in that upper airway may, in fact, uh, help uh, with uh, inflammation and maybe the pneumonitis component. So we are keeping patients on our IV 500 milligram azithromycin uh, along with the hydroxychloroquine. Um, after the loading dose, 200 BID, uh, they go down to on day two, um, 400 milligrams up front. Uh, and uh, we are run, running out or ran out of the uh, anti-IL-6 uh, medication, which uh, we discussed in the other sessions for rheumatology uh, diseases such as uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, and that type of thing. Uh, we were using that in our patients who were sicker, more severe, um, and uh, we don't have any more. Uh, there may be alternatives, though, and the biotechs are popping up. I got word from one of our infectious disease doctors, and she... Uh, let me know about a, a drug called Loronlamab, L-O-R-O-N like Nancy, L-A-M like Mary, A-B like boy. And uh, that is a CC45 receptor inhibitor. Uh, and it also has IL-6 inhibitor properties, uh, kind of like the one we're using now. Uh, and TNF uh, inhibitor as well. Uh, I believe Cytodyne is the name of the company that's, that's trying to get that one rolling and I believe has an IND number. Uh, so we will be uh, looking for studies and compassionate use in our more severe cases if we do, in fact, have trouble getting more of our uh, interleukin-6 uh, inhibitor. Uh, we'll go with uh, possibly something like this. So that's pretty much it on the treatment updates. Um, uh, everything else has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, what I did want to discuss tonight is uh, quickly the concept 
and I was talking to one of my colleagues this, uh, this afternoon about this. Actually, two colleagues uh, brought this up, and these physicians were curious about the concept of vaping and having pneumonitis, and we had big press about that recently. Um, my colleagues have given lectures. I gave a lecture at a local school as well on vaping and, and, and the uh, negative effects of it and the counterfeit vapes and that whole story with the THC and how these kids, uh, some were even having neurologic and seizures, others were getting pneumonitis, but almost an identical pattern to the COVID-19 uh, pattern that we are classically seeing on CT imaging, CAT scans. Uh, and actually one uh, uh, look at this is that physicians that look at the uh, CAT scans uh, and other clinicians can actually uh, call it and, and, and make the diagnosis of COVID-19 in the right clinical scenario with less uh, false negative uh, uh, than the actual swab itself. So it'll be interesting to see if our eyes looking at the CAT scans making the diagnosis in fact better than the PCR swab that uh, is operator dependent and there is processing issues. So it's a curious question, but the four that we have, up, uh, three that we have confirmed in the ICU and the one probable all have this, a similar pattern on a CAT scan. One didn't have a CAT scan. Um, it is recommended that we do a CAT scan on these patients, as, as we mentioned before, uh, on a uh, admission if we can get it. Uh, obviously, there could be triage issues or they just got too sick. And honestly, you can follow the chest x-rays in most of these patients uh, without giving them a CAT scan, I think. Um, if it's uh, significant enough, you'll see it, uh, the ground glass opacities, even on x-ray, and we'll see if it progresses to ARDS, and we'll be able to follow them like uh, our one youngest patient who is, uh, I believe, turned around, um, and uh, our young 40s, uh, he has now gone to nasal cannula from high flow oxygen, I'm happy to report, uh, got the kitchen sink. So uh, uh, pneumonitis, again, and when you vape, uh, it, it can cause this pattern. It, uh, sort of follows the uh, vascular bundles in some cases, and we saw some pneumonias recently a couple months ago that when I look back at it, I wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, if, uh, you know, these were in fact early COVID-19s that had snuck in uh, before we were uh, told about it. Uh, so uh, in retrospect, we don't know if uh, these vape cases, these younger patients uh, or people that were vaping, sharing vapes, were passing around COVID-19 early. Uh, and then just, you know, getting these opacities, a few dying, but most recovering, and most were male, curiously, uh, uh, which uh, we're seeing a, a little bit of predominance, I think, now. So who knows? Uh, bottom line is stay away from smoking, stay away from uh, uh, vapes, and, and certainly if you're going to, uh, do not share uh, at this time. So uh, that's uh, some advice, uh, not to mention it's just not good anyway and can pass around other bugs, if you will. Uh, so uh, whether or not it's COVID-19 or uh, vaping or some other type of pneumonitis uh, or infectious uh, is, is in the workup, uh, and we'll look back at that at some point and hopefully be able to, to figure it out better. Uh, but it looks like we're doing a great job looking at the imaging and making a diagnosis in short. Um, so other than that, uh, I think that was the, the main points to make. Uh, the updates on treatment, uh, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, some other type of pneumonitis or really the COVID-19. Um, and uh, as far as testing goes, it appears that urgent cares and other places are doing it. Uh, again, we want uh, places that are testing and filling waiting rooms to have protocols in place where the people that are doing the testing are extremely protected. And, um, you know, the drive-through type of method is the way to go. And really, patients shouldn't be conjugating in waiting rooms at this point in time, in my opinion, and we've gone to the telemedicine model. Uh, perhaps on an, another segment, we can talk about telemedicine uh, and how it is uh, really moving and exploding overnight. Pretty much every doc is logging into uh, to start a free type of setup, but I think most will convert to a uh, pay service that, uh, in, in fact, has these waiting rooms and scheduling, and, and many are already doing this. Um, the groups uh, that are that are not uh, are a little behind the ball and are trying to catch up now, but telemedicine is big and there's portable carts and, and, and other things that can be set up and the laws, like with most of the things that are going on now with COVID-19, uh, with the FDA and fast tracking things and, you know, looking like we'll have a vaccine in as little as uh, potentially a year, uh, maybe even less, we'll see, uh, which is extremely fast. Uh, and again, you know, almost overnight, 
hydroxychloroquine approval for uh, for COVID-19. Uh, so I heard uh, one of the companies is sending over millions of uh, pills of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Other than that, uh, we want to protect our healthcare providers. And uh, of course, we mentioned last night the mask issue and the gown issue. And um, we want to be as protected as possible. Our providers on the front lines, uh, our respiratory therapists who are in there, uh, constantly our nurses that are living in there. Uh, the docs are trying to do one exam, trying to keep it to as minimal uh, exposures as possible. And um, obviously, if you have to re-intubate somebody or intubate them, somebody's got to go in. And in those situations, those level three situations, it would be great for procedures uh, to have full suits uh, that cover us completely and masks that don't just protect us 95% of the time, but protect us closer to 100% of the time. And so um, we need our providers out there. Talk of National Guards and, and, and some nurses, uh, providers, extenders, docs, whatever, whatever type of practitioner you are, belong, uh, uh, do serve and could get called up. And then, uh, as they said on the news uh, uh, last night, I heard, you know, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. You know, what's going to happen to these providers if you pull them out of the system when the system is just ramping up? And ready to really, um, I think, uh, explode with 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 the amount of patients that are coming in, and we're seeing the the uh, progression just since yesterday. So, uh, with that said, uh, lower level situations where you're going into the rooms of patients that are not suspected to be COVID, uh, well, time will tell if we should be wearing N95s at least for those. Uh, probably not a bad idea. Again, why not have the ultimate protection? Um, uh, so uh, it's something to think about. Uh, uh, I know our ICU uh, has uh, the HEPA filters that we were able to get uh, many of them uh, and uh, converting rooms to negative pressure rooms as we speak. Uh, that's a good thing. And the uh, one thing to, to realize in other ICUs throughout the country, and I think most of the physical plant has figured this out, um, but uh, if the returns in the rooms, especially of the COVID-19 rule outs and positives, are not going back to the central area and then being redistributed that air into other rooms. Uh, we have it exhausting out uh, of the hospital, um, and that's how it should be. Uh, but, uh, you know, there could be a slow ramp up in that understanding. So if anybody works in hospitals uh, with returns in the rooms, make sure that uh, obviously they've, they've either are starting to convert to negative pressure and they have those, those returns either turned off or however they adjust them and the airflow uh, not recirculating into the ICU, obviously, but going out uh, of the hospital. So on that note, uh, we will say good night. Again, March 19, 2020. Happy anniversary, Bernadette, and uh, uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you.